the schooling from Ramji School R K Puram in the batch of 2016. He cleared national level scholarship exams such as K V P Y and N T S C and went on to do an integrated B S M S from I I S C R Pune. Currently, he is working at a startup developing cutting edge A I solutions to medical imagining problems. He is a data scientist at Deep Tech Incorporated. a startup working on artificial intelligence software to identify diseases from x-rays ct scans mris etc from june 2021 till date he has previously worked at the center for excellence in epigenetics a biology research laboratory using hydra vulgaris to study dna rna and their modifications from january 2019 to march 2020 Now I invite Mr. Jitesh to address the gathering. Thank you very much, Bhumika. Uh, I'll try sharing my screen. Uh, I made a small presentation uh, just to aid my conversation. So I hope it's visible and it's changing for everybody. Yes, um, please, dear. Go on. Please go. <laughs> Thank you. so uh, i am not an expert on what career options all the kids should take what is best for whom i think that's up to the kids themselves or their parents or like whatever comes out of their discussions what i can talk about is my own experience my uh, the way i approach things and how i went about it so it's a short presentation on this my uh, a case study of myself right so a little bit about my school life in school life i took part in various competitions debates like every uh, my very close friend shivam who will be speaking to you tomorrow i think uh, both of us whichever competition we could find we would just apply for that competition we would go so school life was great fun amazing i also took part in editing sanchita uh, with all of the english teachers hindi teachers uh, we used to have this entire team it was so fun then in 11th and 12th we uh, i took science stream specifically pcmb which uh, is considered very uncommon when you say oh i took maths and biology both people often say why or like oh my god how but uh, seeing the strength of the class that had taken maths and biology both it did not seem like a very uh, weird choice so yeah and i think both are very interesting uh, uh, subjects and so i wanted to take both and uh, kvpy i cleared in class 12th i'll come to kvpy in a while at the end of the presentation so um, yeah so my main issue was that in 11th and 12th i loved physics a lot and i loved biology a lot and i could not choose between the two and so i did not really want to go into engineering where i would leave biology behind i did not want to go into uh, medicine where i would leave physics behind so i took uh, admission in iser pune here are some photos of my college uh, i did not put the photos of classrooms <laughs> i put the people and the facilities uh, it's an amazing college it's called indian institute of science education and research it's a college by uh, there are around seven isers in all of india right now they started in 2006 and uh, remaining you can google about it but it's one of the most highly ranked colleges in india uh, the degree that it offers is quite unknown to people right it's an integrated bs ms it's not a, a bsc plus msc it's a bs and ms which is not very different they, they both stand for bachelor of science and master of science but there are still some differences uh, the way the course is structured so these photos you can see one is of the cricket ground one is of the tennis court and one is of a gathering that we had when uh, the ca and rc protests were going so we had a solidarity march uh, for them ourselves so it's a photo from that time uh, yeah so our college is focused a lot on research as uh, bhumika introduced uh, i worked 
on hydra vulgaris hydra is an organism it's about this big it's like uh, 2 mm to 5 mm right so on the right top you can see in a petri dish uh, there are some hundreds of hydras 100 150 hydras collected in a tiny you know maybe 3 ml of water and the other two images are of hydra zoomed in and you can see that there's a new hydra budding in uh, this is some deformed hydra something happened to it and this is how a hydra usually looks so uh, what is research is an extremely complicated question but to try and answer it is basically it's knowledge production right we are trying to see Uh, for something very specific very narrow it's like a puzzle piece that is not known and that you want to solve and you can add to it and the great thing about iser is that you can start the addition in your undergraduate itself it's not uh, in other colleges they like pehle pad lo and then uske baad tum sochna ki tum bhi kuch contribute kar paoge tum bhi kuch add kar paoge but in iser that's not how they think in fact they think that if you try to contribute to the world's corpus of knowledge then uh, while doing that you will also catch up well on what is already known right and uh, it is also very like taking you know one specific thing for example what is the uh, most interesting fact about hydra is that if you cut any part of it it will just regrow it so if you cut it in the middle it will become two hydras if you cut it into four parts it will become four hydras right and so what are the things going on inside its body right i cannot cut my head and then you know my head will regenerate the entire body and the uh, body will regenerate a head that won't happen in humans so what is allowing the hydra to do that a lot of research has been done but we keep adding on it right here i have one image of what my day to day work in the lab looked like which was basically smushing down the hydra uh, like grating it or uh, crushing it right and then extracting its dna and this is what is called a gel electrophoresis so i did some modifications to the dna trying to look for a particular strand of dna whether it is present there or not right and so this is called a uh, ladder and according to the ladder if we see uh, the dna at a particular length we can say oh okay like this was our expected location and the dna is here so our experiment confirms the presence right uh, and what other things we can go uh, in later the course design right this is the interesting thing and this is why i went into iser right it's 5 years it's a bsc plus msc even if you do bsc plus msc at any other college it will take you 5 years but here it's slightly different because it lets you do more in 5 years it's 10 semesters the first three semesters you have to study physics chemistry maths biology even earth sciences and a little humanities so it's very comprehensive you get to study a lot and that is why i chose iser because i did not want to choose between physics and biology just yet and iser gave me the option of trying out both for a little longer and then making my decision then the next five semesters is your specialization right which is kind of the masters the msc part and in that uh, you then if you want you can still continue doing a little bit of all subjects but mostly you choose one subject or maybe one two subjects and you go into them deeper you do that right so i took biology i think around 60 to 70% of my courses were from biology and the remaining uh, 20 30% were from maths because uh, in college i realized that the maths in college is a very different thing from maths in 11th and 12th and i found it extremely interesting that sort of maths so i took that and then i did not feel um, very inclined to the kind of biology i was doing like or i thought that i have done i have got this experience let me try something new and so in the last two semesters we have to do a one year project which is uh, called a masters thesis and for that i was applying in a lot of computer science things like combining computer science and biology but then i got a project which was solely computer science solely data science and so i did that and while i was doing that project i was doing it at the company where i'm currently working so at deep tech and so i got into uh, this company so what after iser right so college is also uh, 
like when kids think about colleges the next question is you know what will the college enable us to do where will it enable us to go so since iser is extremely focused on research uh it motivates most of the students to go for phd after phd you can apply to be like a research staff in uh companies in scientific companies in pharmaceutical companies and such and such or you can uh work further and then you can become professors in universities uh and researchers of your own labs you can manage your own labs so most people after iser go for phd and they go all over the world i think around 50% of my classmates have gone to europe and usa to do their phd's right and some other students they tend to go for higher studies in other fields like mba or maybe prepare for upsc and some others uh, like me go for a job uh which i'm currently doing so i won't go into a lot of details of what i do it's all the buzzwords that you can listen to the data science and artificial intelligence and machine learning and all of that jazz uh i can just show you one photo that will kind of sort of explain what i do and if you guys want in the question answer session i can discuss more so this is an x ray of a knee and this person has arthritis and so uh, you can see that usually there needs to be a little space between the two uh, bones right and that space has completely gone right so this person is very very sick. like the arthritis has proceeded to a very high stage and so this uh, reddish bluish thing is what our computer is looking at the ai uh, model is looking at and so after looking at this knee it has said ki this is uh four out of four rating in arthritis which means that it's the most advanced stage of arthritis they might need a knee replacement or something like that and so uh the fact that our computer itself can predict it we don't need a doctor or the doctor can just confirm right so if we have 10000 x rays our computer software can choose 500 of them to need the most attention and then the doctor can just look at those 500 right so it's even helping doctors uh reduce their work effort and such right how to get into isers uh very shortly so i think this is the last slide yes this is the last slide right so you guys already know about iit jw jw the main and jw advanced if you get a good rank i think it's currently under 10000 if you get a rank under 10000 in jw advanced then you can apply for isers then there is kvpy uh, kishore anik protsahan yojana it is uh, uh, done by iisc uh, organized by them and it's an exam that you can give in 11th class in 12th class and even in first year right so you have three attempts uh, on giving this exam and the best thing about this exam is that when you if you qualify it then you also get a scholarship while you're studying so my basically my entire college fees was paid by the scholarship itself because my scholarship is uh, 5000 per month for the first three years then 7000 per month right and my fees was like uh now iser's fees has risen right but at that time the fees was like around 3 4000 per month only so my college fees was basically being paid by uh my scholarship the other uh way of getting into iser is the state and central board channel which is scb state and central board and if you get above a certain percentage in board exams in your cbsc then you are eligible to appear for the iser admission test iit right and again you give that test and you qualify and then you can get admission iser so i think around 50% of students are taken in by the iser admission test and the remaining 50% are taken by the jw and kvpy ranks so yeah uh, that is all i have uh, if anybody has any questions they can ask me yes i have some questions i have collected some questions from the students now uh, jitesh uh, children want to know what is the percentage or score that one should have in class 12th to get into this uh, uh, data based courses is there uh, some particular yeah. percentage that they should get if they want to pursue this course so in iser uh, yes right like uh for giving jw i think there's 80% uh cut off right you have to get 80% boards then you can give jw exam 
and for isers i think it is slightly higher the number is always present on the iser website i can share it with the kids after the session right so i think it would be around 90 91 92% in cbsc uh, if you give that then you are eligible for giving the iser admission exam and we also wanted to know if there are some uh, coaching centers uh, for this particular course and are they really useful so i think any uh, jwe coaching works for iser as well right because two of the exams are the same jwe and kvpy uh, if you give those exams so the syllabus is often uh, exactly the same for the iser admission yes. test and even for kvpy they can ask bio questions right but bio if you are very well versed with the ncert books then bio is not much trouble in either the iser exam or in kvpy so Uh, yeah and but for physics maths and chemistry uh, the normal jwe coaching institutes any of those will cover the same syllabus what are the good institutions in delhi where children can pursue this course so of I mean, course from uh, pune yeah so um, like the bsc course right it's uh, du of course delhi university has bsc courses right but uh, i guess in if you take bsc from any college or any institute in delhi then you will have to kind of go out of your way to gather the same research experience that you get handed to you in iser right so i cannot think of any uh, institute right now in delhi which has like research at its core the way iser does maybe iit offers some bsc courses they would also be more research oriented right but yeah another question how is data science different from software engineering or software jobs how is okay. this what is so, the difference i am not very equipped to answer this because i have not done any software engineering so i don't know what happens in that but uh, basically for example the x ray image that i showed you right so i am working on the algorithm that produces that image that produces that prediction that it's a 4 out of 4 uh, severe arthritis case so i am making that algorithm but when you sell that software right uh to a hospital or to a doctor right so what would they want they would want a good looking window where they can upload a scan they can see the results they can maybe print the results in a word file right so all of that wrapping in a good uh, format in a good software that is the task of a software development engineer here that is something i can't do but the algorithms behind them is what i am designing so that is uh, artificial intelligence development all right they also want to know what kind of sectors are data hmm. scientists working in oh data science is being applied right now in every single thing right so uh, you have uh, this medical imaging which i showed uh, my friend was working in insurance so kind of like getting the claims and then automating those claims to like you know filing the claims or uh, which category they should be put in that was one thing that he was doing right and uh, artificial intelligence is very important like in nowadays if you in your phone you write uh, flowers right it will select all of the flowers photos for you all of that is artificial intelligence when you talk to google you say play this song for me that voice recognition is also artificial intelligence right when you oh, go on a say dating app and you want to meet a person who's best suited to you then how's that connection made right which person is most compatible to you all of that has artificial intelligence now built in so i think anything that you know you can do uh, you can also apply artificial intelligence to it and that is happening right now they also wanted to know whether there are jobs in the government organizations so i am not really sure if uh, data science is being applied uh, much in any government sector right now uh, but again like i think by the next 5 years 10 years there will definitely be some things uh, that will happen 
because you know like for example cryptocurrency that we saw this year till last year cryptocurrency wasn't even anything on the government's mind and by this time it is so important that they had to bring in legislation in the budget right so that is going to be the force of ai over the next four or five years by the time these students complete uh, their graduation right that it it won't it would be something that could not be ignored by the government so <laughs> there will be right problems. right okay so they have a future in government jobs too in case they take up this course yes okay yeah. Now, uh, there's another question. Uh, one child asked me that people get paid for selling their data. How do you interpret that? <laughs> yeah, so um, I think uh, that's a very great question. And I think our lawyer friend would be able to <laughs> throw some paper light on it. <laughs> But um, yeah, see, we don't really understand the implications of all the data that we are agreeing to give right? and uh, the kind of predictions that could be made on it. Uh, like it could be things that you don't know you want yet. For example, there was a case where a person was starting to get recommended uh, pregnancy stuff, right? And uh, he was like, I don't know why this is happening. And it turned out his daughter was pregnant. And neither him nor uh, his daughter knew about this, right? But the AI algorithm knew that we should recommend uh, maternity uh, materials to him. And then they took the test and they realized, oh, the, the daughter is pregnant indeed. <laughs> so uh, the implications, the far-reaching implications, we don't have any idea like what could be what could be happening. Uh, so I think that privacy is very important. But then again, if we don't have this data, we would never know what all we can do, right? So for research purposes as well, like uh, getting access to different kinds of data is also very important. Wonderfully explained, Jitesh. Thank you so much for taking these questions. And over to you, Charu, ma'am. If you have some questions on the chat box, you have some more questions to answer. Uh, ma'am, I can see great. two questions right now. I will just read them. Um, Jitesh, yes. the first question to you is from the chat box. How many seats are there in IISER, ISER? How many seats so, in total? Uh, yeah, so there are seven ISERs, right? And uh, not all of them are equally equipped. So ISER Pune and ISER Kolkata are the biggest. And they are taking in currently a batch of around 300 students per year, right? And uh, then there are the smaller ones. And I think the smallest one is in Bahrampur, Odisha, uh, which is only maybe taking 100 or, uh, yeah, around 100, 120, 150 students, right? So in total, I would think all over India, only uh, some 2,000 students are selected in Iser, right? And... Yeah, and then you can imagine like with the reservation and stuff. So, yeah. Okay, another one is, Jitesh, uh, do you recommend any special AI course along with a normal bachelor's and the master's degree that helps you, you know, facilitate or get onto higher levels in this field? So uh, definitely, like, I don't know, for example, if you take an engineering, uh, if you take a BTEC in computer science, right? So I think a lot of these things might already be getting covered, right? I had to go and so in my college, there was not much uh, courses on AI, right? All of that I did by myself. So of course, I also took the help of Coursera and of like tutorials but basically googling right like how to how do i do this and then reading a blog that comes up right so there's a data science uh, blog uh, towards data science that's a very famous blog right and they have articles uh, basically like any question that you can google will have an answer on towards data science right so towards data science coursera that is where i I did, but then again, you can, uh, if you're interested in going for a BTEC in computer science, you can look up uh, the colleges. And if you just dig a little deeper, you will find the entire course syllabus spelled out, right? And so then you will know exactly what they're going to teach and what else you can do on your own. 
So that's all from the chat box. Thank you so much, Jitesh. Very well taken up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Any you other questions, Bachalo? Do you want to ask something? Yeah, if you, you guys have any questions, you can, you can, yeah, you can also raise your hand. You can write in the chat something. box or yeah. You can raise your hand on the Zoom chat. <laughs> Jitesh, what are your future plans, Vita? What are your future plans? What would you like to do now? So, uh, for the foreseeable future, I'm going to continue with this company. I think it's a very exciting place, but I am also very interested in teaching. And one thing that I did not uh, cover in my presentation was uh, Disha, which was the social wing of Isaac Pune. And I was a big part of that. So, with Disha, I used to go to villages around Pune and I used to interact with the school children there, right? And then I used to contrast the kind of knowledge I got at Ramjas versus, you know, the kind of <laughs> teaching that is happening there and even relevance, right? Like for us, maybe learning algebra and all is important, right? But for them, they're not seeing the relevance of it and it's not even relevant really, right? So... Uh, these questions just are in my mind and and right now I'm just like exploring options, seeing, uh, you know, NGOs and all that work in this field and maybe I'll go talk to them in the future. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, right now I don't have anything uh, in that direction really fixed. So I'm going to continue working at uh, working in data science. <laughs> Wonderful. You answered the question so well and you explained so well and you took the, the pains of making a PPT for children to explain <laughs> what you were in school and how the transition happened. Right, Sumanva? Anything? Yes, absolutely. And Jitesh said, I remember he belonged to my house, Veena's house. Am I right, Jitesh? Yes. <laughs> very, very enterprising that point of time also. Or I still remember that any competition, any event, he used to be our hope always, always. And he would always give his 100%. Any venture, any work, any competition, Jitesh used to be our last hope. Every hope, rather. So <laughs> it's his patience, his hard work, and uh, the focus that he has reached uh, uh, such a stage in life. Congratulations, Jitesh. I'm very, very proud of you. Very proud of you. Thank I you. haven't known you, but I'm indeed proud of you, how you presented Beta. I have a question. Now that you worked with Disha also, what do you foresee the future of education? What kind of a change do you see, transformation in school education or in curriculum in the years to come? Do you? Do you foresee? So, the um, Recently, the national education policy has come, right? And it seems very interesting, the kind of things they are proposing in that. And so it really makes me hopeful. But then again, um, I think the main issue is the money you put behind it, the number of teachers, uh, right? Like, because I think the private sector can only do so much, right? The villages... Uh, do need the government to take over for them, right? And there, as long as there's one teacher for 400 students, nothing is going to happen, no matter how great you make the curriculum and how uh, well you design it, right? And I think that technology can only help to a certain extent. The, what a kid really needs is that interaction with a teacher, that conversation that helps them grow, and yeah, and so for more teachers, for more, uh, you know, interactions, you just need more money and less administrative tasks. And unless the government is willing to put, uh, you know, their money where their mouth is, put money into education, increase that, uh, there's not going to be very much change. But I can be hopeful. I'm hopeful. <laughs> that they very well said, wonderfully put. Wonderfully put. So you stay on, you don't go anywhere and you can always contribute whenever the next one comes in, right? Okay, wonderful. So Smita ma'am? Yes ma'am. Thank you Jitesh and Siddhant. Thank you Mr. Jitesh C for giving us an insight into the technical world. May I now request Bhumika to introduce our second speaker. Ms. Arpita completed her BALLB honors from National Law Institute University Bhopal in 2021. Since then, she has been working with Cyril Amarchand Mangladas, 
one of India's leading law firms. During her time at law school, she actively participated in mooting, publications, and various cell activities. She was the managing editor of Indian Arbitration Law Review, India's foremost journal dedicated to arbitration law. She was also a member of the Fifth Joint Academy on Trade Law organized by the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade along with the World Trade University, University of Bern, Switzerland. Now I invite Ms. Arpita to address the gathering. Hi. So thank you, Bhumika, for the generous introduction. And before I say anything, I am extremely honored and privileged to be back and talking to you all. It's such a nice feeling to see all my teachers. Uh, so like you said, I passed out from Ramja school in the year 2016, after which I did my BLLB honors from National Law Institute University, Popal. I graduated last year. And since then, I've been working with Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas as a corporate lawyer. Uh, so how I planned today's session is that I will tell you all how I ended up doing law. Then I'll discuss uh, what my journey was in the law school. And thirdly, I'll discuss with you all what is life outside law school, like what all you can do after a degree in law. So uh, how did I end up doing law? After 10th standard, I realized that I was not particularly inclined towards sciences. I did not enjoy studying science that much. And I always had an inclination towards humanities and social sciences. So at that time, I was exploring my options, what all I can make a career out of if I study humanities. Back then, school did not have humanities as an option. So I took up commerce and I had the privilege of learning under Suman ma'am, Poonam ma'am. It was indeed a very nice time. Uh, but uh, just to give you a bit of context as to how I ended up doing law. So my father works in the parliament secretariat and law and lawmaking procedures have always been, you know, a part of our dinner time, our breakfast, our lunch conversations. So that is how I got inclined towards law. And at the same time, there was a distant relative of mine. Uh, she was also a graduate from one of the national law universities. And I saw her leading a very rewarding career, a very challenging yet rewarding career at the same time. So I thought, okay, uh, if this is something I want to pursue. Uh, once I made up my mind ki I have to pursue law, then I started looking at, you know, what would be the good law schools in India where I could study from, how would I get admission into them. So after a bit of research, I realized that in India, the premier institutes to learn law are the national universities. And to get into them, you have to clear the common law admission test, also known as CLAT examination. Now, the good thing about CLAT examination is that person from any stream can appear in that. So regardless of whether you have a science background, a commerce background, or a humanities background, as long as you score 40% in your board examinations, you are eligible to sit for the CLAT examination, which gives you entrance to the 23 national law universities that are there. And many other private colleges also accept the scores of CLAT. So two years of hard work, two years of smart work, two years of a lot of balancing between schoolwork, tuition, homework, coaching, mock examinations. And in 2016, I sat for my CLAT exam. And by the grace of God, the blessings of my teachers, I was able to secure an All India rank of 297. And then I ended up getting admission to National Law University, Bhopal. So that is pretty much about how I ended up doing law. Next, I would like to give you a brief insight to what life is like in law school. You know, if any of you are into watching Suits or any of those programs. So I thought I'll just share a little bit into what goes behind becoming a corporate lawyer. Uh, life in law school, I would say that the learning curve is really steep. Uh, because law school, not only the academics are challenging, uh, and if you want a breakup of what subjects we study in law school, I would be more than happy to take them during the question and answer round. But to keep it short, uh, they, I had a trimester system in my college for four years. 
so and after that in fifth year i had a semester system so in total 10 semesters of academics uh, but one thing very uh, interesting about law school is that they really push you to develop holistically so there is a lot of emphasis on extracurricular activities you have to take during law school and at my time in law school i tried and put my hand into everything so i did mooting which is basically a simulation of the courtroom experience we go there we argue on problems we submit our pleadings uh, that's about mooting then there are there is alternate dispute resolution so you can do mediation negotiation um i also spent my time writing some research articles and publications so i was interested in the interface between law and technology so something on cryptocurrency something on blockchain and research articles are you know really good way of developing your researching and drafting skills and apart from that there are cells with varying mandates there are cells which uh, similar to what jitesh said we also had a cell where we used to go to the villages and you know teach students uh, from school and spread some awareness about the legal rights awareness about legal education in general apart from that we also had a legal aid clinic where we uh, where the law students used to hand out advice to the not so fortunate members of the society legal advice we used to give out uh apart from that a very important part of law school experience is internships and i believe internships are very essential to the learning that we have in law school because you get an exposure to what is the practical side of your profession what exactly would that entail so during my time i had a variety of experience in internships i was able to intern with the national human rights commission uh i was able to intern with a body that advises government on trade and investment issues so i was with the center for trade and investment law uh i interned with some uh, corporate firms i interned under the chief justice of patna high court so it was a very enriching experience in all uh lastly i would like to speak a little bit about life after law school uh and if you were to ask me i would say that law as a degree gives you an opportunity to be as to pursue careers as varied as uh you know from public life to a corporate lawyer from you know a public prosecutor uh to an in house counsel so the options are lot with a law degree you can become a in house counsel you can become a public prosecutor you can join the corporate you can start your own practice you can sit for government examinations you can become a judge so a law degree offers you a lot of versatility when it comes to what you can do with it uh that is pretty much from my side and i would be very happy to take questions thank you arpita i think you've answered most of the queries but i shall still put forward you know the, the children want to know the difference between clat and ailet and how so, is the pattern different uh, yeah so um in terms of pattern uh, i'm not very well versed with what has happened in the recent times i can share my experience from what happened used to happen in my time but uh, the Uh, exams are such that in ielts you are you are given lesser time lesser questions but more analytical questions in clat you are given more theoretical concepts uh, as in you are to apply your mind to legal propositions so that is there the difference between ielts and clat i'm not very sure of what the pattern has been in the recent times i wrote the exam 5 years back but ielts gives you admission to national law university delhi and clat gives you admission to other 23 nlus in india actually i was i knew only about clat i didn't know about ielet this is <laughs> thank you so i am also learning in the process in case i want to take up law uh, and uh, children also want to know that uh, do you think there are some personal traits that a lawyer should possess a person should possess to become a good lawyer uh so i am divided when i answer this question there certainly if you have an acumen for see few skills i have realized are important to be a lawyer you have to have the interest in reading 
because more than half of my day is spent going through pages and pages and pages uh but yeah if some people do have a flair for speaking some people do have a flair for arguing but my time at law school i've seen that you know people who were initially not very confident doing these things when they come out they at the other end of the law school they have been able to develop those skills over time so i feel it's a mix of yes you can have some skill sets which are intrinsic and part of you but there's nothing that you cannot develop in those 5 years that you go to law school yes uh they also wanted to know that do you need to do law to become a judge yes you yes. need to okay. yes you need to do law to become a judge okay and one question i'm i'm uh, asking you this because this one child said that ma'am please do ask this question that why does it take so long for a case to end <laughs> i wish i could answer this question i know i thought so she said ma'am still you please ask you know would like to hear her view point <laughs> i really wish i could answer this question but uh, the system has become such that there is so much uh, backlog there that it takes time i wish i really i really wish i could answer this question why it takes so long for cases to settle that is something my clients would also be very happy to hear <laughs> <laughs> no worries thank you so much arpita you answered all the questions so beautifully thank you so much uh it's uh, and if any one of you wants to ask anything else or you know after the session you want to contact i would be more than happy to share my email with you there are a couple of hands that you can see yes kavya yes beta kavya you can unmute and also no. you can switch on your video for a change and ask the question Arpita looks so different from what I saw her in her school uniform. <laughs> It took me a while to actually say, "Oh, <laughs> yes, very distinctly." I remember she used Hi. to be so. I mean, uh, she would always look for the correct answer. She used to be very, very logical. She no wonder she's a lawyer, ma'am. No wonder. <laughs> no wonder she chose the most upright career. <laughs> Arpita, is it very... law in India? I sorry, I just wanted to ask if you do law in India, is it possible to go abroad into international law? What is the kind of? Does it allow you, or there is some kind of a bridge course that you have to do? Uh, ma'am, most countries require you to clear their bar examination if you. practice law in india because even in india after i completed my course i have to sit i have to sit for the bar council examination so many people sit for in the new york bar examination some sit for the uk scotland examination if you are to practice there you are supposed to clear their bar examination uh hello yeah kavya kavya yeah uh i'm kavya and first of all i'd like to say that i'm very inspired by you and I have been thinking about pursuing law since the last year, and uh, I had two questions. First of all, was that what do companies take? Uh, what do companies take into consideration when they're actually uh, uh, selecting interns after the law school? And my second question was that what exactly do you have to do when you become a corporate lawyer? Like, how is it different from being a normal lawyer, like the government lawyer? uh i'm very you know i'm happy to see some people interested in law <laughs> because back in my time i did not have many peers to you know discuss the fact that i wanted to pursue law uh so your first question was uh, i sorry i forgot your first question but second question i remember you saying that uh, sorry i lost the track of the questions but can you come again hello uh yes actually there was no permission to unmute myself that's why i'm uh, struggling with it uh i i was asking that what do companies look for, uh, look for specifically when they are picking out interns after the law school my first question was that and my second question was what exactly do you have to do in like uh, corporate law jobs corporate law. which is different from being in a government court okay so what do companies look in an intern uh well i 
tried to emphasize it during my, my conversation previously but in law school they look at you very holistically so they'll see in how many extracurricular activities you have participated grades obviously play a very big role so in you know getting shortlisted for internships most of the nlus have their own placement coordination committees so most of the big law firms are coming and contacting with the pcc and the pcc will f- forward your name for that particular process your grades would be the paramount thing that they look at but apart from that they will like to have a look at your cv how broad it is what all activities you have participated so if you are generally planning to do law i would suggest that you know try your hand at as many activities as you can in your law school as far as your second question is concerned regarding what how does corporate law look differently from courtroom so uh, i personally am a disputes lawyer so i do get to go to the courtroom get the courtroom experience argue but most of the corporate lawyers are on the transactional side so they are looking at things like mergers and acquisitions of companies raising funds in you know through the capital markets the, those are the sort of things that corporate lawyers are mostly doing and normal lawyers are you know generally attending courts uh, arguing before courtrooms doing matters of those sort uh, i hope i am able to answer your question yeah i'm sure you did beta but uh, uh, yes, must be uh, kavya could not get unmuted i think yes kavya yes ma'am yes ma'am actually there's no permission so the host has to unmute me every time so that takes a bit of time i hope i answered your question uh yes ma'am you did thank you thanks a lot for that thank you best of luck for if you need any other guidance i would be more than happy to help you thank you that means a lot arpita what i understand is what we all have understood is that if you want to uh, pursue law as a profession you have to be ha- you have to be an avid reader yes yes ma'am read reading and imbibe reading is one of the most uh, reading essentials reading and then imbibing also yes. good at communication yes ma'am certainly logical reasoning analytical yes, thinking yes ma'am right then legal space is the place to be legal sphere is the place to be yes ma'am right so uh, it was really a pleasure listening to you ha huh? now Ma'am, the pleasure is all mine to be able to the, the table <laughs> the pleasure is really mine to be able to speak before you all after such a long time the pleasure is entirely mine i mean you have become so very confident yeah they all look so wonderful <laughs> na young adults arpita what prompted you to take up corporate law why not criminal law why not some other law why okay. corporate Ma'am, so the experiences I had, I, I was particularly interested in arbitration, and I spent some time in my law school doing arbitration, uh, you know, moots and gathering experience of that sort. So that prompted me to try corporate law, and I'm still open to trying other things. It's just that, uh, if I may say so, uh, after law school, uh, corporate law is uh, giving me a very handsome salary at this point of time. So for some time, I want to stick here. later on i might try something else <laughs> go frank wonderful <laughs> good very good i think i just am very proud of our that, children very proud i understand ma'am that uh, law is one profession that you can take up at any age yes ma'am certainly yes. certainly you can take it at any age and i would you know encourage you to take it because uh, the experience thank you ma'am the experience of learning it law itself is a reward you know what beta arpita i wanted to do law at my age now but they told me now you can't study law, you know you are barred from it because you are over age much much over age mom is that so yeah beta so i can't study now you know but i have to study in order to do this so i can study and know about <laughs> it but to get a professional degree at my age i can't <laughs> sad na <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I I thought I'll be able to take up law after I. Yes, ma'am. I that don't... was the impression. I was also under that impression that in the center law, the center law CLC in Delhi, they allow you to take up law at any age. Well, I will again. I will again go and find out. You know, because I still have that desire. <laughs>
ma'am certainly because for nlus there's an age because clat mm. has a age limit to right. appearing for it but other law schools i i don't uh, think there would be an age bar i might be mistaken no uh, fingers crossed i'll also do my homework <laughs> love you much arpita for this Thank wonderful you, session uh, siddhant Thank you, Miss Arpita Pandey. Ma'am, questions in the up. chat box are left. Oh. Have some questions. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead, Arpita. Ah, there are some questions. Yeah, Charu, please go ahead. Yeah. There is a question. Is it necessary, Arpita, to go for joining in a coaching center to be able to crack the admission exams, or with just the personal efforts and a good command on the syllabus, would do? Uh, ma'am since the paper is a, of a very generalized pattern uh, i would say that you can prepare on your own but subjects like general knowledge and legal reasoning they would require some help so i personally took a coaching for 2 years and you know going to coaching i feel gives you an environment you see everyone around you st- um, studying those things you get people to discuss those things so i personally feel that it's not absolutely necessary to go for a coaching but it would help with subjects like legal reasoning and general knowledge where the subject matter is vast and you need to know what all you uh, have to prepare for the examination uh one more question from the students uh the bar council does not recognize online llb mm-hmm. in general do you recommend any online courses after llb that uh, make your knowledge better uh, especially from the indian government i mean the free online courses uh, ma'am courses or uh, what sort of courses online 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 courses any law courses other than llb uh i personally haven't had the chance to look at what's been taught on those courses so i am not in a position to answer no no i have one question arpita do we need any basic legal training as a non lawyer <laughs> yes ma'am some things uh, i feel every citizen should know so i feel certain things uh, like for example uh, post training is something that lot of all organizations should take into account when they uh, go about their daily activities so i feel post is one area where i have seen organizations taking up trainings uh, what else should i say i mean the more uh, the the more aware you are the less uh, professional engagement there is for me <laughs> less chances of you <laughs> engaging me but uh, i would say that yeah things like posh and all i feel something uh, are things that uh, even non lawyers should know beautiful answer dear thank you so much bachcha thank you thank you ma'am the question charu ma'am uh, no done thank you arpita thank you ms arpita pandey for enlightening us with this amazing career option Now I request Katyaini to introduce our third speaker. Mr. Mishal Shetty. Mr. Mishal is a brand and UI UX designer with 6 years of experience. He has worked on a plethora of projects for clients such as Government of Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh Tourism, Microsoft India, IIT Delhi and many others. from creating logos for events and companies to crafting new age digital experiences he is primarily a storyteller who is focused on creating engaging and relatable narratives for brands through the visual medium he graduated from the science stream in school and went on to do his bachelor's of creative arts from the srishti manipal institute of art design and technology bangalore He continues his journey of learning by keeping up with the new year technologies and trends. For him, design work is a playground he gets to explore every day, a space to research, experiment and build in. Now, I would like to request Mr. Mishal to share his experience and understanding of a career in design. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um I'll just share my screen. I have a short presentation
can everyone see my screen yes we can go ahead beta okay so hi my name is mishal i'm a brand and ui ux designer so i just wanted to quickly explain what what is design actually so i think there's a popular misconception that if you are someone that does drawing and art you are the only one that can be a designer but design is um a lot about four pillars that i have reduced one of which is telling a story so how does um as a designer how do i tell a story of a brand for example one of the best examples i can think of is nike and their logo of a tick mark which is which basically tells you the story of how it's a sports brand so it's always moving and it's dynamic uh the second pillar being solving a problem for example an accessibility problem in a place where there is a lot of staircases you need to also think of people that may not be able to climb a staircase so how do you incorporate a ramp within that design the third pillar would be communicating information i'm sure a lot of you have seen billboards like this around the city um it's an apple ad for their iphones which basically communicates how good their camera is that you can just take a photo with your phone and it can be put on a billboard the fourth pillar would be experimenting with the unknown so for example creating an guerrilla marketing advertisement using a simple bench for a chocolate company so a lot of my work has to do with actually playing around so if you enjoy like exploring different things and understanding new uh inventions and discoveries that are taking place and thinking of new ideas and uh figuring out how to solve different kinds of problems uh design is definitely that kind of work environment the work environment is very much like a playground so there's different types of design um there's product design graphic design motion graphics design ui ux design and industrial design so product design is to do with building digital or physical products and designing how it will look and how it will function graphic design is more about communicating information through shapes and fonts and colors and motion graphics is adding um uh, animation to those to basically to graphic design ui ux design is about designing digital experiences like uh websites and apps and industrial design has to do with designing physical products like cars or furniture or uh every everyday objects that you use i am a i am basically a uh graphic design and ui ux design so what is graphic design i specifically do something known as brand branding design branding design um to use a good example would be mcdonalds mcdonalds has a very recognizable visual identity the colors they use very bright colors they have a very recognizable logo with this golden arches as they are known you can recognize it from like a far away they even basically uh branding design includes using design to uh communicate the brand language across different uh verticals for example on their packaging and uh their bags including even trays at a mcdonald's restaurant is uh the red color of mcdonald's to communicate that same uh brand experience across wherever you go in the world a mcdonald's will look the same so this also includes like products and ads as well so ads also will tend to have similar um connotations to the whole brand itself so in summary branding design is about uh creating a unique identity for any kind of company or product and solving problems for them through these colors and fonts and logos that you design for them uh so ui ux design is basically 
I'm sure everyone has used a Google search. So UI stands for user interface and UX stands for user experience. These fields are basically about understanding how someone needs to use an app and what kind of problem you are solving for them. For example, a Google search is built for you to get information. So the fact that you have the name of Google right up in front, so you know where you are, and then you have a search box simply placed right under it, and that's about it on your entire screen. So you don't get distracted from other things. This is part of UI UX design. Another good example for this, as we are currently using, is Zoom. Zoom is a very well-designed software, which has been, so as you can, if you can see on your screen, there'll be all the buttons at the bottom, which have different functionalities and how they're designed. For example, a microphone using a microphone's graphic. So you never get confused as to what the purpose of that button is or how a gallery view must exist so that you can see all the participants. So just thinking of these things and solving problems like that is part of UI UX design. So it works for websites and mobile apps and all electronic appliances and machines that we use, which have like a interface where we get to interact with those uh, is part of UI UX design. So in summary, user interface and user experience design is about creating a user-friendly digital experience. It should, the main aim always of UI UX is to make something that anyone can pick up and start using. Okay, so is design for you? Design for you would be if, I would say if you are a curious person, if you are a creative person, if you enjoy solving problems and puzzles, if you enjoy finding out new information about things, if you think you think differently to other people around you, I think it's definitely something you should look at design then. Um, as well as if you enjoy explaining things to other people, um, once you have learned that. Um, so now I'll go through uh, the stages of how one can become a designer. So this is written in three parts. One is your school, your college experience, and then careers thereafter. So to begin with, in school, um, preferably, but it is not necessary that you, it would help to take humanities or science in your 11th and 12th for uh, the children who are in 9th and 10th. For those of you who have already like chosen your streams, it, uh, it may help to have these because they also expand your mind and verticals within other spheres of learning. For example, exploring geography and history or physics and chemistry and understanding uh, how different analytical tools work within those spaces and how you gather information and what kind of information can be always used uh, to inform a design career. So next we come to college. So in college, there are, there are a lot of design colleges now in the country. Um, the top ones being the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad and IIT IDC in Bombay and IDC in uh, IIT IDC in Guwahati. Um, but this is as per your research, you will find colleges that fit better with um, how you guys want to. Um, sorry, how you guys want to exp a, uh, what kind of designs you want to explore because all these places are well known for different sorts of design. So depending on what kind of design you would like to do, you can explore like different colleges. Okay, so the college getting into college is split into two parts. One is your entrance test. So all colleges have a design aptitude test, which tests different types of skills, um, which is a sort of holistic way for them to understand uh, whether it, it's also a good way for you to understand and for them to understand how you can get into this field further. So uh, these are a couple of things that they look at. One is visualization and spatial ability. Uh, there is environmental and social awareness, which is uh, like general knowledge and what is 
current affairs that's taking place in the world. Um, there is analytical and logical reasoning. There is language and creativity. There is design thinking and problem solving in terms of um, shapes and questions and mathematics. Uh, there is observational and design sensitivity, which is just uh, based on your powers of observation of what is happening in the world or when a certain design changes or popular uh, movies from the past. It's uh, similarly related to general knowledge. Then they test your drawing skills and your creativity uh, by giving you a made up situation where you uh, creatively express through drawing uh, or coloring an idea or a space or an object. Um, and lastly is your communication skills based on having read a comprehension. And I'm sure all of you are like used to doing like reading long comprehension passages and answering long answers for them. Uh, that's definitely a part of this, but uh, it's leaning towards being creative within that. The second part of getting into college is your interview and assignment. So the interview is a very important part of getting into college once you have cleared the aptitude test. Um, they check for your personality and confidence, communication skills and reactions in different situations. They can ask you any number of things related to literally anything that is in your life or you have experienced or you may have not experienced and want to experience. Um, and then comes the second most important part in that is your portfolio. So now your portfolio is basically a collection of artworks that are created by you. Uh, this can range from photographs that you are taking or drawings you are making or paintings or sculptures or any number of creative expressions. It can be creative writing as well. For example, if you write poetry or you write short stories, there's any number of things that can be considered an art piece which can come into your portfolio. Um, then is the creative assignment. So basically they will, a lot of colleges give you a singular question uh, for which you have to come up with a response which has to be creative. Um, they may say, you can only use a matchstick and a uh, fork and a candle, and you have to create a sculpture with that. Or any, I mean, it can, it, it's literally, they can come up with literally anything and you have to be able to respond to it with a creative solution. So this is a college, getting into college uh, as is. Um, so the other thing I want to just briefly touch upon is that the college experience is usually a four year course uh, with, within which the first year is known as a foundation year, which is probably going to be the best year of your entire life because you get to explore so many different things across so many different fields uh, because at a design school, you are not restricted by the field you choose because it and uh, the subjects you may be interested in. So even if you are interested in, say, just to take an example from our previous speakers of uh, law or uh, data science, you can actually use those fields uh, and your knowledge within those fields or your curiosities within those fields to come up with a new kind of design for a problem that a lawyer may have or a data scientist may have. Um, so there is, I mean, that's your foundation here. Thereafter you start specializing based on what your uh, interests are, whether it's product or UI UX or branding, um, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, then comes your career. So where can you possibly work as a designer once you have graduated from uh, a design school? So there are a lot of different places a designer can work. One is a design studio, uh, which is dedicated only to solving design problems for a variety of clients, whether it's a large company or a, a small product company or an NGO or anything of that sort. 
You can also work internally at a design team in a corporate setting. So for example, uh, I did an internship with Microsoft India and Microsoft makes uh, software products, but they also have a, their own internal design team. So they are always looking for designers uh, to solve UI UX and app based problems and web based problems. Um, you can also get into design research, which is basically joining a think tank of people from different fields and you add your skills of problem solving and creativity to all sorts of problems, for example, policy making and uh, uh, any, I mean, any sort of uh, field where there is research being done within that space, you can get into uh, a design research role. Then there is media publishing groups, which is like ad agencies. So you can work on with big brands on like, the kinds of ads that they come out, whether it's a video brand, video ad, or a, a print ad, which comes in a newspaper or a magazine and things like that. Then there's a production studio. So you can actually get into filmmaking and VFX artists, and you can just explore a whole other range of like art direction and how a set should look for a certain kind of ad or a movie. Um, and then there is game studios. So gaming is becoming like one of the largest growing industries in the world. And you as a designer can join the gaming industry to uh, work on like the newest games that are coming out, like the largest companies in the world all actually have now satellite offices in India. So you can like join studios within India itself. And then you can see uh, the trajectory of career going from working at a satellite office in India to probably even going abroad and working on projects, uh, big budget like Hollywood or Bollywood projects that are there. Um, I just also wanted to quickly mention some famous and notable designers from our country who have made some amazing uh, work. Uh, Benoit Kumar Sarkar is uh, the man who has designed the Del Delhi uh, Transport Corporation's logo. I'm sure you have seen this everywhere. It is such a simple logo, but it conveys exactly what the Delhi Transport Corporation does and the Indian Airlines logo. Uh, another person I'd like to mention is Sujata Keshavan. She is responsible for the branding experience of all the uh, rebrands for the airports as they are being rebuilt, the newer airports. Uh, anywhere you see any kind of branding related to the airports, and uh, Vistara was one of the brands she's worked on for Tata's. Uh, another person is Sudarshan Dheer. He is extremely famous uh, Indian designer who worked on the HP and uh, Titan Corporation logos. So yes, I, that's about it. And um, thank you everyone for listening to me patiently. That's and really I can lovely. take any questions. What an effort you made, Beta Michal. Lovely. Yeah. Absolutely lovely. So nice. I just have one question. Sure. I don't know, I'm breaking the queue, but then I can't resist. You know, the packaging that is coming in products these days, you sometimes don't want to do away with it, whether it is, yeah. whether it is an Apple thing or it is just a simple pen box, whatever it is, or even the Mithaika Dabbas for that matter, sometimes they're so... It's so well done in terms of material, the packaging, everything. Could you just throw a little light on that and how are they actually going into reusing and, you know, the kind of the recycle, reuse and all of that of the packaging part? Definitely. So packaging design has, um, over the last like 20 years, it has rapidly changed because uh, I think a lot of companies are starting to realize uh, people pick the products based on the packaging and not just based on a name that has been carried on by reference. So a lot of people, now the focus has shifted to what kind of packaging is being uh, made. So uh, people are also putting design resources towards making better packaging um, and having a better unboxing experience. So uh, I don't know, like a lot of, just for an example, like if anyone opens a, a phone box when they get a new phone, the way the phone is always like right on top. So you just, that's literally the first thing you get to see, like just designing this thing as an experience where a designer will sit and think of how 
uh, someone might like look at that phone when they open it because of things like that. So I think pa- packaging has packaging design comes under branding design and uh, graphic design. So it's definitely a interesting space. But are they looking at those three R's? Are they actually using those three R's now? Uh, so a lot of companies have now because uh, of a lot of like uh, laws in place for them to have to follow those things. They do follow uh, the three R's, but uh, there are also a lot of brands that do not do that. But hopefully in the future, I think everyone would probably shift to sustainable packaging. Thank you so much. Yes, Smita, ma'am. Further questions, ma'am. I have a few questions, uh, Michal. Yeah. The first question, which I think most of the students wanted to know, is that is this career a lucrative one? Okay. Yeah, I think that's a very valid question. And yes, it is absolutely a very, very lucrative career. Um, and you can have some uh, tremendous growth in your career through this whether it's financially or being intellectually stimulated and constantly being on a, a journey of learning actually uh, so definitely um, across different verticals it is it is a lucrative field yes and they want to know that uh, is art different from design uh, these two I, fields are very confusing. Yes, uh, that is a very popular misconception. Um, art is usually just uh, a medium of expression that is restricted to being a medium of expression, whereas design usually tends to solve some kind of problem, whether, as I had mentioned, it's either telling a story or, a, or communicating a, a message or something of it, it solves a problem, basically, yes. Another question is that are game developers and graphic designers the same? Uh, okay, so game developers usually work with game designers. Um, so game designer would probably make a character or uh, sketches of a world in which a game is existing. And then a game developer would basically take that visual and put it into code so that other people can play games using buttons or interactions that are there. And and of course, children want to know what exactly is the job of a graphic designer? What does he actually do, he or she? Okay, so I can just in brief uh, explain uh, sort of like a day in my life. Uh, So when I wake up in the morning, I usually get a brief or a problem from my boss who will tell me that, okay, today that we have to make a logo for a brand uh, that is selling, for example, uh, juice, uh, 100% like fruit juice. And I have to basically come up with a logo which conveys uh, something like that. And so I will sit for probably like half a day and spend that time thinking and drawing and sketching out and doing research on other brands that exist and uh, things like that. And thereafter doing, uh, making proper logo designs for something like that, for example. And uh, then I show it presented to other people. So I communicate the message that I'm trying to say with that logo. Um, And I, yeah, I mean, just exploring different parts of design, like the colors or the fonts that you use, because they, different things mean different things to different people. So the red that you see may be a very different red than I see. Uh, So definitely these are, uh, you touch upon a lot of different things, as I said, um, with when you're when you're a designer, so every day is a different day, and uh, every day is a new day, literally, because you're just solving new things all the time. A new challenge. Sorry. A new challenge every day. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, students also wanted to know that how can they plan a career in graphic designing? That, of course, you just explained. He wanted, uh, they also wanted to know whether there were some drawbacks in this 
career. Uh -huh. If there's something that. Okay, so to be honest, uh, drawbacks I think are uh, part of life for everything. Whether you are, uh, I'm sure, uh, my other, uh, the other guests can also uh, uh, speak on this. But like it's. The, I wouldn't say the field as such has uh, so much of a drawback. Actually, it would be kind of the opposite. As I said, like we get to explore the world and other fields through the field of design because we're constantly just figuring out new things. So I would not really say there's so many drawbacks within this field. Of course, one question which I think I should have asked all the three speakers the students wanted to know that how do they convince their parents to allow them to pursue the unconventional career options here lies the challenge <laughs> i think yes. uh... so michal if you could and maybe arpit and jitesh can also tell us um honestly that's uh, i think that everyone has that struggle um but uh, the first and I think the most important question is probably asking yourself and convincing yourself that you understand and know what you're getting into. Um, so to do your own research, I think this is like the first thing. When you want to do something, you have to do the research for it. Although if you don't know what it is, uh, you may regret it later on. And if you have done your own research, I think it becomes very easy to convince anyone that you have uh, you have the right side of things, I guess. I mean, as a lawyer, I guess that's pretty much what it is, right? So. Yeah, I think it needs a lot of courage, a lot of courage to step aside from the mainstream and taking up uh, design as a career, isn't it? I also want yeah, to say something, definitely. ma'am, and so does Jitesh. Yeah, go ahead. Come on. Mom, I agree with Michal to an extent that first you have to convince yourself when, because I remember my time, my parents were not very happy with me not taking science and going for commerce at that time. But if they see conviction in you, if they see the fact that you are inclined towards doing that, you have certainty towards what you are doing, then it's easier to convince them uh, to go for that path. So I agree with Michal on that extent. Many questions in the chat box, also, ma'am, for Michal. Wait, wait, wait. First, let Jitesh say to this one. Yes, Jitesh, what yeah. would you like to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jitesh has a question for you, Michal. You know, he has a question yes. for you. Oh, yeah, okay. okay, I asked something in the chat box. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, I don't know. My career is not as unconventional as it gets. It's uh, probably the most conventional one of all these, right? Like yes. uh, do an engineering and then get into data science. That is what is currently the path, <laughs> I would say. What is unconventional is doing a BSMS instead of a BTEC. And uh, that is definitely an interesting path. What I think it allows you to do is uh, you can go to say a foreign country, you can be at the cutting edge of science, right? And like science knowledge for its own sake, rather than knowledge to, you know, to maybe sell something or knowledge to produce something, just knowledge, like just figuring out why the stars in the universe are a certain way or why does the Hydra region, how does the Hydra regenerate its head, right? So that is an interesting experience in itself and it allows you to, um, so like going for a BSMS, going in a research uh, field really can let you like explore the world also, uh, go outside, do see the research work, they right? can put you in uh, at par with others and if you go the exact path that they suggest which is you know after research you start your own lab become a professor then currently in india professor's life is very chill uh, they have like uh, basically a job guarantee till they're 65 and uh, i see that my professors they have <clears throat> access to this beautiful wonderful campus but then the problem with that is that you know out of say 1000 1500 applications for professors that come to my college every year only one new professor is hired so the competition for becoming a professor is like really really harsh 
but uh, going through bsms getting a phd a phd is uh, like opens up amazing opportunities for you and uh, also like yeah it increases your reputation a lot <laughs> so to say like you know to be say dr jitesh seth uh, so that also counts a lot and people listen to you <laughs> so that is an unconventional path uh, which i did not take i did not <laughs> take it yeah what an innocent reply <laughs> wonderfully put <laughs> yes yes garu ma'am are there some more questions and jitesh you had a question for michal ma'am jitesh had a question for michal that he put on the chat box i think yeah yeah so i just want to ask uh, you said you spend one day making a juice logo right is one day even enough um it can actually be i think a lot of people um, don't realize a lot of design work has just to do with just being in your head all day thinking about things in a different way and to actually draw something and make it into a logo uh, doesn't actually take that long it's the part that comes before uh, you actually come up with a really good idea that is uh, so definitely in a day it's possible it's probably possible in less than a day um, but yeah <laughs> carry on with the questions ma'am the question charuma yeah um for you michal another yeah. set of questions what are the ways to get through creativity blocks and do they affect the day to day work as a designer okay so definitely um i think everyone goes through creative blocks uh or i mean i can't this is a very subjective question because everyone has different ways of getting through a creative block but definitely um uh, for me personally usually reading doodling um there's this thing known as free writing which is kind of like journaling but you can also um uh, you don't necessarily have to write coherent sentences just to get uh basically it uh, gets your creative juices flowing just to understand and connect different sorts of things within your head even if they're not related to the thing that you want to actually achieve for example if i'm stuck on creating that logo um and i can't think of juice related ideas i will start thinking of something completely different and usually because i have a task at hand uh eventually i will come around my mind will automatically come back to that so i think just basically getting yourself into a zone of doing something and like taking action even if it's like going for a run and coming back and not noting something down um an idea can strike anywhere right so yeah there is another question yeah a student is writing that i have been constantly engaging myself in editing videos and using various applications for the school events and i really enjoy doing it and wish to learn more is this interest area any way related to graphic designing um i would say yes and no yes because um at the end of the day it is also some format of an expression that is solving is either telling a story for example when you edit something you are basically trying to tell a story in a certain kind of way so there are similar uh, tools being used uh, within that space but it is also different in terms of what exactly you would study in a graphic design course would be uh to create uh, to use software to create shapes and colors and fonts of in a certain in a nice looking way or to convey a certain message um whereas in a editing video editing you would probably use a video editing software specifically to do the same exact thing okay another one is any specific software that we can use for creating graphics uh so i think this is one of the be- one like one of the better inventions within this space which i think everyone can probably give a try and it's free uh it's called <clears throat> canva so a lot of people use canva to create like posters and invites and short videos and such so i think everyone can definitely uh log on to canva.com and 
try and create some graphics for themselves just to uh, see whether they have that creative spark or not. Shal, another one is, can you suggest any online designing course that can help us build our portfolio or resume or any other course that can give us a head start in the graphic designing field? Okay, so honestly, um, I would not say you need to take a course, an online course, but there is, um, I mean, I'm not even exaggerating. There's an infinite number of free resources on uh, YouTube. And um, I, I don't know if you will believe me or not, but every single day that I don't know something, I will open YouTube and find a tutorial for myself to explore those softwares. For example, as I mentioned, Canva. So you can probably look up Canva tutorials for a specific kind of uh, design that you want to create maybe, and you can find a tutorial on it. And th th there's just so much, so many uh, just free resources available for you to build a portfolio. I mean, even like photography, if you have, if you you can use your parents' phone, if you don't have a phone, just take some photographs because if you're interested and you can just print those and that's good enough to, that's exactly the thing. You can just make up everything as you go along. Yeah. Three more questions. One, okay. can I become an interior designer if I have done a course in graphic designing? Uh... I wouldn't say no, but it may make it difficult to make that transition since uh, the specific kind of softwares and um, ways of approaching a problem you go through with a graphic design course may not apply directly in an interior design or vice versa also. So interior design would be more uh, towards architecture. So it's a uh, rather technical instead of being very like visually oriented. What skills do we need to become a successful freelance graphic designer? Okay, so freelancing is an interesting space because it actually, freelancing as a designer means you are um, basically running your own business. So it has, uh, your design work is only one part of it but actually being able to speak to clients in a communicative way or uh, taking care of your accounts. So there are a lot of different verticals in a business as you may see, and you have to handle all of those um, alone. So definitely there are skills other than just design that you have to learn as a freelancer to manage something like that. Michal, one last question, though you addressed it in the first two slides. One student is asking, is graphic designing stream neutral? Uh, in what context? I mean, science, humanities, commerce. Oh, it, yes, I definitely. Mean, yeah, um, I have peers of mine who also came from a commerce uh, stream to the design school because the design school has no, uh, it has basic requirements of having a 70% um, cutoff. So anything above that is you can apply for a design course and from any stream. Uh, I think the main thing, as I said, was the portfolio and your interview and your entrance test. Very well explained, Michelle. Thank you so much for taking up all the questions. Lovely. Yes, no Thank you so much. Michelle, I have one question for you. It's Definitely. Yeah. Different, but then I, I can't help myself but ask. What is the way we look at in India? We look at design. When you look at anything that is designed in India, you'll find a lot of vibrance, a lot of ethnicity that you can see. But when you look at any foreign design, it will be so simple and placid that perhaps it doesn't even attract you. But then maybe it has more value. So what do you think, having studied design and practicing it, what is the basic difference between a foreign idea of design and an Indian idea of design? Okay, so actually because we have... Uh such a vast country with so uh, so much culture and vibrance within art and design. Um, I think when we see any design that's not from India, it feels a little plain or vanilla. Um, and that's, I mean, it's very understandable, but I think 
it's also an appeal it go the appeal also goes the other way so when we are always surrounded by things which are very ethnically or bohemianly designed within a certain culture and then we have a singular object which is minimal or simplistic uh, it, its appeal may increase so the same way uh, i'm sure abroad when people see um, indian patterns and motifs on our fabrics um and on like whether it's a branding experience for an indian company uh, i think they think of that as something which is so much more appealing and uh, refreshing than just a plain old box or a simple square or a very basic design as such yeah wonderfully said so right Yes, Suman, ma'am. What do you think? What is common between the three of them? We've got three young people today with us. So, what is the commonality? We are coming to the final, the ending of the entire program. You, what I understand, they all are passionate about Absolutely. what they are doing. Absolutely. And uh, they took up the challenge. And actually speaking, they must have decided on their own. They yeah. didn't succumb to any kind of a pressure from anywhere. Self-driven, self-motivated. and that's why they are able to come on uh, this kind of a platform they are that they are able to address the students as well as their own teachers it's yeah. amazing it's really and amazing and so many more yes they've enthused so many young minds today the kind they're of very culture. very enthusiastic very enthusiastic and i never knew that there are so many different kinds of designs <laughs> product graphic and what is this motion graphic design ui ux industrial I, I never yeah. knew. We This have learned a lot. For us also, children, you yeah. are our gurus. <laughs> yeah. Very nice. Very nice. My perspective has uh, undergone a total change today. Yes, yeah, you people are my teachers. You people are my teachers. So, Archil, I am sure our students also must have learned a lot from you and wonderful presentations being given. So, what I feel is that uh, uh, young aspirants like you. do not always look for a decent salary or a safe occupation while making career choices right what i feel is you value purpose over paychecks yeah fulfillment in life satisfaction <laughs> you more want to have satisfaction <laughs> happiness in life yeah. okay uh, i am sure you people must be watching that program uh, shark tank <laughs> right so who is your favorite shark <laughs> undoubtedly it is Who is your favorite shark? Yes, Jitesh. Have you ever watched that program, Arpita? देखा है. Who is your favorite shark? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somebody who is purpose driven. Somebody who is very kind, and he seems to be the happiest of the lot. Piyush Bansal. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you for enlightening all of us, my dear children. Thank I mean, you, each and every presentation was a delight. excellent thank you so much it was a great experience you. and so yeah hoping yes, to join yes. tomorrow again to see our uh, other friends <laughs> oh you want to join in tomorrow also jitesh yeah yeah definitely to <laughs> very good you are most welcome to join in tomorrow as a participant as a yeah, person yeah. who can ask a lot of questions from your fellow friend from your peer <laughs> very good yeah so thank you to arpita jitesh and mishal for finding out time for making the ppt you came down to the level of the children so lovely you could actually come down to the level of the children in making that ppt or the pdf running and explain it to them in the way they would you know understand they can associate it the way they are today in their life how to go about it what to look forward to what kind of exams then what kind of job there after what to look forward to and i also like something else that you also have a vision for where you want to go whether arpita said that i want to be in the corporate and earn a few more bucks in few more years perhaps and jitesh said no i'm looking at an ngo which is so different right and mishal also said that he is also looking in a design maybe some kind of a future in design and later on you know he's also earning at the moment so that was also lovely the way and absolutely the commonality is the passion <laughs> the passion that the three of you have for your vocation for your profession 
and we really wish that you grow you reach the highest echelons in your career you earn great names for yourself and you have a fulfilling careers ahead that's the most important give back to society and if you go abroad to study do come back india really needs people back that's so important right so carry on smita ma'am can we have the formal vote of thanks for the three yes ma'am yes yeah arman can we have the today's session was very informative and interesting we all got to know so much about unconventional career options other than being an engineer doctor or ca the enlightening session has opened up diverse range of career options to choose from thank you so much director ma'am mrs ashna pant and our principal ma'am mrs priya vaidy for this a uh, wonderful opportunity i would like to thank all the three speakers mr jitesh seth ms arpita pande and mr mishal shetty for sharing their experiences and clearing our doubts patiently thank you parents teachers and my fellow students for joining the session thank you all looking forward to you all joining us tomorrow for another interesting session at the same time yeah there's something else i want to 